working? Okay. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak this morning. My first slide, I have to put a disclaimer up. I know we're not getting very much press this morning, but I would hate to read in tomorrow uh, morning's paper that an Air Force spokesman said that creationists are full of it. Okay? <laughs> so these views are my own, and they uh, don't uh, necessarily reflect the Department of Defense. My first experience with the creation evolution debate occurred uh, when I was in grad school. So I, I went to this uh, conference for, uh, it was uh, a creation scientist talking, and any discipline that has science in the title isn't, okay? I, creation science, political science. At that time, I, I, was, uh, I was very naive. I, I hadn't read anything about the debate. One thing struck me as odd is that the presentation was given in a church. And I went to this presentation, and the church was like a half a mile from the university. And at the university, I mean, we give seminars all the time. I mean, many different departments, I'm sure, would sponsor something like this. But I thought, oh, you know, maybe it's parking or something like that. I went to the conference and heard all the arguments that I'd read about before. Uh, um, the man stepped up, and he had, uh, you know, a turtleneck and horn rimmed glasses and a very deep, uh, you know, baritone voice and sounded very authoritarian and uh, authoritative. He talked about uh, monkeys at a typewriter, and I said, you know, that doesn't sound right, but I'm not a statistician, so I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Then he talked about uh, gaps in the fossil record, and I said, uh, you know, that doesn't sound right either, but I'm not an archaeologist, so I'll assume he knows what he's talking about. And then he started talking about the second law of thermodynamics. And I said, wait a minute, I know about this, and this guy is wrong. Okay? So after I got through grad school, I started reading about this, and... I keep reading over and over these arguments about the second law of thermodynamics, and it's not that difficult of a concept. We're going to go over it right here, and what I, my goal is for you to be able to refute these arguments when, when you hear them, because the people that are applying these arguments are either misinformed themselves or they're purposely misinforming other people, and both, I think, are inexcusable for an academic person. The second law is used by uh, some creationists to support arguments against evolution. Now, any step of evolution, I, I've heard the second law applied saying, you know, this can't work, this can't work. The example I'm going to use today refers to the spontaneous formation of protein molecules by amino acids. Now, I'm not a biochemist, I'm a physical chemist, but if you just think about, okay, we've got all these different molecules floating around, if they form into a single molecule, then that's what creationists say could not have happened, and they're wrong. A spontaneous process requires an increase in disorder of the system. And on a shallow level, that's a correct application, and that's the application that the creationists are using. In this case, it's being misapplied, and I'm going to show you how to talk down people that try to apply these arguments. Now, here's a quote I got off the web. If the people in the back uh, can't read very well, I'll go ahead and read it. Going from a big bang to a structured universe, from non-life to life, from simpler life to higher order life, all involve a tremendous increase in complexity. However, it is well proven that when things are left to themselves, they always become less complex. They decay, the opposite of what evolution requires. This is formally known as the second law of thermodynamics. And if you read this argument and, and don't know the uh, specifics, you might think that, yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. But, as they like to say, the devil is in the details. And we'll, what I'm going to do then is define the second law. We'll go back to this quote and uh, I'll, uh, we'll determine why this quote is incorrect. The second law involves a quantity known as entropy. It's symbolized by S. Now, scientists are great at taking a common sense observation, such as the amount of disorder, and assigning numbers to it. And they've done this. You can go to thermodynamic tables, and for different substances, there is a number associated with the amount of disorder. Now, in a process, we can quantify the disorder before and the disorder after. And we call that change delta S. That's not a triangle, that's a Greek letter delta. A definition of the second law from a well-accepted physical chemistry textbook uh, by a, a guy by the name of Adkins is the entropy of an isolated system increases in the, for, uh, in the course of a spontaneous change. And that definition is correct. But the way it is applied is, uh, is incorrect. Entropy increases, that's all fine. What we need to examine is what is an isolated system. And the creationists just blow right over this, and it's a very important point. Okay, what is an isolated system? A system 
is the collection of molecules that we are exploring. These amino acids floating around in the primordial ocean, are these guys going to come together into a single protein molecule or are they not? Okay, an isolated system, and this is an important point, shares neither matter nor energy with its surroundings. Okay, it is completely cut off, it, can't, it doesn't give off heat, it doesn't accept heat, it is completely isolated. Now this is very difficult to achieve even in laboratory conditions. Okay, we use a device that we call an adiabatic bomb calorimeter to simulate isolated conditions. It's very complex, it's very expensive, and I'll say that the primordial ocean was not an isolated system. So any argument that treats our system as isolated are incorrect and they need to be dismissed. Here's a more applicable definition of the second law. A spontaneous reaction results in an increase in the entropy of the universe. Once again, we have to define what we are talking about. The universe sounds like everything, but in terms of science, oh, I was gonna put this here, okay, delta S greater than zero, entropy of the universe increasing. The universe is defined as our system, the molecules that we're examining, plus the surroundings. Now the surroundings are that portion that is not part of our system, but our system can interact with. The entropy of the universe, therefore, is the system plus the surroundings. And if the system plus the surroundings, that sum increases, then the second law is satisfied. So we say system, delta S system plus delta S of the surroundings greater than zero. That satisfies the second law. So how do the system and the surroundings interact? Well, as I defined before, as an isolated system, they don't interact at all. Okay, a system can be open, closed, or isolated. In an open system, we can share both matter and energy with the surroundings. If we run a chemical reaction in an open beaker, that is considered an open system. A closed system, that's almost kind of a misnomer. A lot of people uh, confuse isolated and closed. A closed system is cut off from matter entering our system, but energy can interact between our system and the surroundings. An example of a closed system is a flask with a stopper in it. We can heat it up, heat can be given off, but uh, no matter can enter or leave. So I want to bring up a hypothetical situation. I don't know what the uh, conditions were uh, with the primordial ocean, but I'm going to call it a closed system. Okay, we're going to define it. We're not adding any matter, we're not taking any matter away, but energy can interact with our system. And I, and I think that's a, a reasonable assumption to make. As the amino acids join to form a complex protein molecule, yes, in fact, the entropy of our system does decrease. We start with a bunch of different molecules, we end up with one molecule, we have less disorder. That's absolutely true. But if we have an interaction of heat or work between our system and the surroundings, then we can still satisfy the second law. Now, uh, earlier I handed out uh, some rubber bands. This is a demonstration we do in our freshman chemistry class. Now, please, I ask people, don't shoot them around. We don't want anyone to uh, snap ourselves in the eye. But what I'd like you to do is we take this rubber band, we can call it our system. We can make the system more ordered if we pull on the rubber band. The fibers in the rubber band are more closer together, they're stretched out. The system is more ordered if we pull it tight. Now, I'd like people to do, don't hurt yourself here, is stick the rubber band on your upper lip, pull very quickly, and tell me if you feel a change in the temperature on your lip. You can pull it, you can also release it. Okay, I hope you find that the temperature gets a little warmer when you pull, and then you feel it get a little cooler as it decreases. Any, anybody feel that? Okay, so, what's that? I feel, we're feeling it. Good, 